All right, it's go time. Look at that, we're live. Hey everybody, it's uh, Robin Robbins. Did you know that? You probably knew that since I invited you. Um, I don't know, maybe there's some people on who don't know who I am, but you never know. And um, I'm here with my good friend, and I mean that sincerely, not just a client, he's a client, but a very good friend as well, Bruce McCulley. Don't laugh at that, Bruce. Like, he should be like, you know, you... <laughs> You know, I love people in the in the amounts that they give me money. So he's a very good friend. No, just kidding. Um, I get actually give him money too. So we're kind of like back and forth here a little bit. But uh, so if you're just joining us and you're wondering what the hell is going on, I mean, we had close to 500 people register for today. So I know you guys are extremely excited about this. And um, the topic is a hot topic. Um, and we are going to be talking about how insurance companies are causing MSPs well, you know, there's a little flaw in that. They're saying it's causing MSPs to lose big clients and how to stop it from happening to you and also how to flip that trend and use it to uh, turn leads into clients. It's not necessarily that the insurance co companies are causing you to lose clients. You just aren't stepping up your game and the world has changed. And that's why, you know, we're going on to uh, with Roadshow and the things that we're talking to you guys about. So please, um, in the chat, as we're waiting for everybody to come in, you know, tell me where you're dialing from. I already see Bill, who's in Philly. Bill, are you coming to the Philly? Are you coming to the road show in a couple of weeks? Okay, so we've got Vegas, Michigan, Oklahoma. Woo, now it's going quick. All right, okay, Canada. Wow, there's like, we are international people. Uh, Canada, Madrid, Fort Lauderdale. All right. Cool, Staten Island, Maui, uh, Liberty, South Carolina. Oh, God, I can't even keep up. Can you see this, Bruce? Look at all these, these people. Yeah, I just saw Boston zip by. Yeah, Canada, Kansas City. You know, we're gonna go to Kansas City. Uh, we're gonna tour Robert Herjavec's new big, you know, sock and business. It's, it's like in Kansas City. Um, we're gonna do that later this year. Um, okay, so great, guys. Again, welcome to this uh, live session here. Love seeing where you guys are dialed in from. This is awesome. Miami's in the house. And we're going to be talking about how insurance companies, the changes that are going on right now um, that are causing you to, or could cause you to lose your big clients eventually, and how you can be just a capitalist pig and use this to get customers from your competition. All right. Because that's what we're all about, right? We're not in kindergarten. You don't have to share the blocks anymore. I want your clients. I'm coming to get them. All right. Now do it fair. Be nice. You know, and all, don't be unethical, but you know, there's opportunity out there. So um, just in case you didn't know who Bruce McCulley is, like I said, he's a good friend of mine. We've known each other for a bazillion years. Um, and honestly, I don't, I have to ask you because I, like, I forget how we, we met originally, but at one point in time, Bruce ran an MSP that was my IT company and um, did a great job. And he grew it to a very successful eight-figure MSP, um, sold it, and then started Galactic Advisors. And I think he started, didn't he start Galactic right in the, pa the pandemic or something like? Yeah, I sure did. I was just like, you know what? This isn't enough punishment. Let's just start a new business and uh, try to you know, launch into the darkness of the pandemic. In fact, you were the only person that had events going when 100%. we launched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I took a lot of heat for that, but you know, now look at us. Okay, so anyway, um, but he, so he, he knows how to uh, run and grow an MSP business. So he's walked more than a mile in your shoes, and then he started Galactic Advisors, which really is it's a it's a cybersecurity auditing platform and service for MSPs. And it's actually a little bit more than that because also what he can give you, I mean, his pen tests right now, a lot, and I'm talking about a lot of our members are using the galactic scan in their marketing strategy as a way of proving the need when you're in front of a new prospective customer and um, you're trying to demonstrate to them that they are being underserved. Um, it's just the galactic advisors. I mean, I would, if I don't know the, the number exactly, but my guess is like for, at least for producers club members, I know better than 50% of our members are doing business with you. So, um, you know, it's, it's really taken off. It's like one of those vendors that's come into the space and the need is there and the service is excellent and the pen test is amazing and people run it. And it's just, it's been fantastic. And um, 
Bruce basically got his experience um, in, in doing these mini pen tests and, and cybersecurity and ransomware uh, working with hospitals and was doing incident response to hospitals that had the worst ransomware events. And um, imagine like a whole entire hospital being shut down because of ransomware. And Bruce would go in and actually turn things around. He would be the one that him and his team uh, would remediate that. And so he got, he got really entrenched into what happens after a ransomware attack, how do the hackers get in, the devastation that they do. So he comes with that experience. And again, he's now working with a lot of people in our community. I can highly recommend him. Um, and I do highly recommend him I, all the time. Um, if you're an MSP and you really want to not only make sure you're not hackable, right, to do the things that you're supposed to be doing, because obviously, you know, you, you, <laughs> don't get hacked is like rule number one, right? And that's your rule number one. And then rule two, don't let your clients get hacked, right? Um, so he does all of that. And um, we have a slide, I think, uh, Bruce, you got a mission. So it, tell us a little bit, like fill in the gaps of what I you know, just told everybody. And No, Robin, you just, you just really nailed it. So what I did is I sold my MSP and I started this mission to help protect a million people. And I mean, that's exactly why we're here today. And, and uh, we wanna help MSPs in three different ways. The first one is, is when it comes to getting third-party assessments, I mean, I remember when I was running my MSP, you're basically having your competitor analyze your environment. And that just creates a ton of stress. And so what we've decided is, how do we help MSPs get to a spot where they can get an actual third party assessment that's being done, that's not being done by somebody that's going to come in and sell their own security stack. And then what we learned quickly is, oh my gosh, folks need help. And so what we did is we linked all of our reports and all the, our findings back to tools and simple scripts that people can use to address these different issues. So imagine you get your report from our team and it has, it has a whole bunch of different issues on it. And you can just go in and click that issue and it brings up a video recording of how to address it with some scripts to take care of it. And then finally, I mean, you mentioned this, Robin, like having a third party do an assessment takes, takes the, that conflict of interest out of the situation when somebody comes in and says, look, look what we found, it's different than you saying, oh my gosh, you know, you need to buy our services because we found this about our competitor. So it, it just really changes that conversation. 100%. And just real quick, guys, just a, one, a little housekeeping item. People are saying, by the way, they love your marketing too. So I take a little credit for that. For uh, you should take all, so and, I'm a member. No, not all member. of it. No, you're, no, no, you're great. I mean, he's fantastic. You're a great marketer, 100%. No, I mean, so I-, I learned I, from I, the best. I, that, I mean- <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but I would also say, guys, this is being recorded. We will make sure you guys get a copy of it, right? Bruce, are you going to provide the slides to people as well? Yeah, we'll, we'll get the slides uh, okay. out to folks through the dashboard. I mean, we'll get over to your team, Robin. I think that's uh, how we've done it in the past. So absolutely, we'll get it out there. So it's being recorded. You're going to get the slides. And if you have any questions, put it in the Q&A and not the chat. The chat's kind of like, you've got like a little fan club here. They're saying, oh, I love his pen desk. His Bruce is awesome. Woo. Um, so um, it's my mom. <laughs> So I just wanted quick housekeeping. Yeah, please put your questions in the, the q and I'll be looking at that as we as we go on and I'll be feeding them to you, Bruce. But um, yeah, because I know people are going to want to take notes and they're going to want to go back and watch this again. So, all right, onward. Awesome. So guys, we're going to talk about five things today. We're going to talk first about what the heck is going on. Then we're going to spend a little bit of time digging into why it's happening right now. Then we're going to think about who's at risk and we're going to talk about what's not working, like what we've seen partners do out there, what we've seen other MSPs in the community do, and what we've seen insurance folks do, and just what's not working with your clients. And then finally, what is working? So those are the five things we're going to cover. Super simple. Let's just jump in. We're going to talk about what the heck's going on. So I don't know if you guys have seen this lately, but insurance companies are showing up with their own security teams, as in they have actually hired or bought or whatever the situation is, they start bringing in their own security teams. The other thing that we're seeing out there is insurance companies are scanning your largest clients and then sending them a nasty note or something like this, basically talking about dropping their policy if you don't address the things they found. Now, they're not just doing this like in the middle of their 
like at the end of their renewal cycle, they're doing this throughout the agreement. And guys, it's not your smallest clients that are getting these notes. It's the big ones, the ones that are spending a lot of money with you. And it's also the ones that are spending a lot of money on insurance because the bigger the policy, the more interested in they are to coming out and sending something like this. Now, Robin, I know you're looking at this going, oh, shoot, what does all that mean? Let no, me. No shit. Oh, okay, no, go ahead. I'm just. <laughs> no, you're, you're right on. I mean, basically, like, if you get this note, like, I mean, just imagine if Robin was your client, she got this note. It says, our security team identified this problem with Microsoft Exchange Server. All of a sudden, she's like, oh my gosh, what's going on here? What's my MSP doing? And at the bottom of this, it says, you know what? We have an, a security team that will take care of this. Just reach out to us. They're not sending this over to the MSP. They're sending it to your client. And they're sending it to the CFO or the CEO. They're not sending it to like the receptionist. So this is really creating a problem for folks that are basically having to try to explain their way out of it. The other thing is, take a look at the middle paragraph here where they want evidence that you fix the issue and then they want evidence that you remediated any possible compromise. And they won't just take you saying, ha, I found uh, an attacker and I got him out of the network. They want evidence, like they're gonna want a third party to go through and actually audit that and provide you and them proof that there is no longer any indicators of compromise. So this is like a big problem and it's not an inexpensive problem. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, shoot, who is their security team? Guys, you know who their security team, it's another MSP. It's just somebody that got friendly with the insurance company and they're the ones providing this. They're also going into situations where, and we've, we've had three reports of this so far this year, they're going through and they're analyzing networks, but they're using old domains that are out there. Like imagine, you know, Robin is currently changing up some of her um, branding. And so she has an older domain that'll be probably disappearing in a while. And so when that happens, who man maintains those old domains? Well, a lot of times they're not maintained. Somebody buys them up and then they put stuff in that, that basically abandoned location and now your person, your client looks bad and all of a sudden you have all these extra problems. So this is happening. And then finally, we've ran into five situations so far. And I just think this is crazy where the insurance company is showing up. They're saying, hey, we have this, this particular MSP we work with. We'll give you a 20% discount on your cyber if you use them because we know that they're so secure. Now, this, I think this is a real challenge. And this isn't small potatoes clients. Like one of the folks that I was talking to, he's out on the West Coast. He's losing his largest client. Think about that. Think about if your largest client walked out the door, not because you're doing something wrong, but because their insurance carrier showed up with an MSP. And I know that, that there's probably some other stuff going on there and some other pieces to the relationship that need to be addressed. But the bottom line is, this is something that you want to get in, in front of. And guys, just to recap on this, just to remind everybody, this is not something that's happening on the renewal. It's not something that's that they're just like doing at the end of the year. This is something that's starting to happen throughout the year. And Robin, I, I mean, just kind of like looking for some some thoughts on what you would do to get in front of this if you were an MSP. I mean, like, like is is the right answer just getting out there? Yeah, you know, no, I, like I want to, I was just thinking I need to stand corrected because I didn't, I, you know, I, I did know this, but I didn't know it was happening at the level it is, you know, because I said it's, you know, basically your insurance company is going to cause you to lose your biggest client, but it makes sense. Like, so, you know, um, one thing I know from working with Rusty Goodwin, which by the way, I haven't even mentioned Roadshow, I was supposed to do that when we started, but Rusty is somebody who's going to be talking at, at this year's Roadshow and you know, he's a big insurance company and he works like he is, he is selling, selling compliance, uh, compliance as a service. I found Rusty through um, compliance manager, right? That, that product, cause they hired me to do like a marketing kit, like, you know, something like, like what I've done for Citricom and Microsoft and others in the past, right? So they hired me to do this marketing kit which actually I'm doing for you too. I'm doing some marketing. But anyway, so they do. And I said, okay, part of my research, I said, give me your 
top customers, the ones that are selling the most licenses of this software. And they send me Rusty. And I'm like, Rusty's an insurance guy. I, I, and I almost didn't take the call because I was like, oh, I'm not going to talk. Like, y- y- you're confused. I need who's selling the most. They're like, he's by far the first to sell most of these. And I got talking to him. He's an insurance guy. He's not an MSP. And he is actively going to his clients and selling them compliance manager and offering that as a service and is now blending into going, hmm, well, why not start an MSP division? Because what happens is when he's auditing their insurance policies and he's using compliance manager, he's basically coming up with a list. Here's all the things you need to take to your IT company and make sure or IT department or whatever. And you got to make sure they're actually doing this to be compliant. And then if they're not, see what he's, what he's running into is he gives the list over to his customer and they're paying him, paying Rusty to be the compliance guy to kind of help them manage the compliance. He goes back another month later, a quarter later, and he does the scan again. And they say, and he says, you know, these things still haven't been fixed. And so what he's, what he's finding is that there's insurance companies are now, like, like you said, they're, they're starting to, to smell the opportunity, number one. Um, the other thing is insurance companies are upside down because it's when it comes to cyber, because there's a lot of policies like we, uh, some of you out there probably have experienced it. We had it happen to us where we had to renew our policy and they won't even renew it. They're losing, they're losing money on these policies, right? I, so, absolutely, no, Robin. And I think that's okay. exactly the perfect lead into why is this happening right now? I mean, think about it. The risk is going up when it comes to ransomware. We've got these different response costs that are going up. Replacement costs are through the roof. Cyber hygiene for users is terrible. And we've got incident response plans that just have never been done. And when we look at the numbers, I mean, just to kind of like mention like upside down insurance companies, a ransomware payment, which was on average, $300,000 last year is now up to just south of a million bucks. And when you think about it, it's not just ransomware. Like think about business email compromise. I was just on a call with one of our partners who had multi-factor authentication set up for everybody in one of his clients. They still had a business email compromise. I mean, it's gone up from 60 to 77% from 2020 to 2021. And if you look at this article that was about uh, some findings by the FBI, they're saying that there's a 65% increase in the amount of the business email compromise, like the actual fraudulent event itself. So when we think about that risk, and you always look at risk as likelihood versus impact, when we think about that risk, all of a sudden, they're pushing up into that really highly likely area. So the insurance companies who deal in risk are like, no, this is not, this is not good. We are, we are upside down. I think that's a really good way to describe it. Then we talked about those response costs. Think about your team and how much more they're costing. We're talking security, IT, forensics, and legal experts all being more expensive. And we're, we all know that you have to budget more for IT equipment, which is required like when you're doing an incident response. I mean, we used to have crash kits that we'd have to take with us with a whole bunch of stuff in it. Those are more expensive. And then we got the users, right? How many of you out there on this call, just hit us up in chat. Like how many of you have users that are 100% now working back at the office like we all thought they were going to do? Anyone? Come on. Like, I'm, I'm serious. Like, we are seeing a situation where people are splitting their time between working at home and working at the office. And that leads to a situation where they take that computer home, they work on it there behind a Walmart firewall, and they bring it back in behind that corporate firewall, and they bring the attacker with them. And so that leads to what do you do when you have a breach? And 77% of businesses don't actually have a plan for a breach. Yeah. I think this number's low because like when we do audits for MSPs, MSPs are probably like 80%. And then- 80% that, what, having a plan or not having a plan? No plan, no, no plan, plan, Robin, yeah. yeah. Well, people I mean, lie on surveys, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, we make, we make them fess up. <laughs> I'm 120 pounds. Like, sure you are. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and but I don't and so that much, you know. Exactly. And so, I mean, this is this is exactly what's Robin saying. Like, insurance companies are upside down, and they don't like losing. So that's that's why the other reason that they're coming after this. They see an opportunity, and they don't like losing. And so, 
that's what's going on there. We talked about the who's at risk piece. I mean, just kind of like to touch on this for a second. Guys, you might think that it's small clients or big clients, but what we're finding is that it's all of them. And really, if you think about it, it's this whole security journey. You remember the security journey, Robin? You helped me with this. The whole concept of being between basic needs and security minded. And if you think about your clients in this way, who are the ones that are buying the cyber insurance? They're the ones that are all the way over on that security minded area. So when they get those notes, when they get the things from the insurance companies, they're worried about it because you taught them to be worried about it. And so now we have the situation where the best clients, not the size, but the best clients are the ones that are at risk, the ones that understand that cyber insurance and, and putting in the tools, everything you recommend are really important to them because they don't want to have a breach. And that's the type of thing that we're running into here. And that's why... I just want to like make sure everybody understands that this is not something that's just starting. Like, like last year, we had two partners reach out to us in the entire year for help with an insurance situation. And I'm cons- calling an insurance situation something where they can't renew, client can't renew, they need somebody to help them figure out what the next steps are. We're getting three people a week right now. And it's not because we grew that much. It's because we're seeing much, much more issues now with MSPs, specifically trying to renew your client's cyber insurance around ransomware. And I'll tell you, I mean, just just to tell you what's not working, and Robin, this is crazy. The first thing is not working is waiting for the insurance company to show up and then answering no on stuff. Because think about it, if you get declined, like if they decline you coverage, now all of a sudden, everything gets more difficult. It becomes more expensive. It becomes a longer process. They're going to have more questions. And ultimately, they're going to be more hoops for you. Because when you go through and you do that, when you wait for the insurance company, you have to say, no, I don't have this. No, I don't have this. No, I don't have this. All of a sudden, you're coming to a spot where they're going to say, oh my gosh, we can't cover you. We're not going to renew your insurance policy. And then the next form you fill out, they're going to ask you, have you ever been denied an insurance policy and you have to say yes like you can't lie on these i mean okay maybe you could lie on those but that turns into a hot mess too because when you lie on them you don't get caught right away you get caught when the incident happens um i remember doing incident response at this one hospital and they couldn't collect on their insurance because they had lied on one of these forms like it's a big deal because the forensics team finds something like passwords not set up for rotation they said that they were in place. They decided that's how the hackers moved. And now all of a sudden the insurance company's like, oh, not our problem anymore. Have fun, boys and yeah. girls. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so the bottom line is do not wait for the insurance company to come through and analyze your client network. And, and there's another reason for that because if they, they do find a problem, think about that email I just showed you. They want you to fix the issue and then they want evidence that it was actually fixed. And I think that's really challenging. Mm-hmm. So. I would, I would just make sure that you're not allowing them to have that conversation first with your client. And I, I keep saying this, but I, I want to drive it home because a lot of people are like, oh man, I don't need to do marketing. Like I don't need to get in front of people right now because I have so many clients and I'm so busy and I'm really afraid that they're going to think, oh, it's okay. I'm just going to let them talk to my client first. And here's what happens. They show up with this list of requirements and they hand it to your client. They say, fill this out. And then you sit down with the client and you say, oh, we don't have this in place. We don't have this in place. We don't have this in place. You need to buy this. And all of a sudden, what you've done is you've taken somebody that's security minded and you've pissed them off. Mm -hmm. Because how many times do you like, have you had a CEO that you've ran into that loves being told what to do? Like zero, like CEOs hate it. And so you're coming to them, you're saying, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. And your client who's been investing in everything you told them to is now like, what the hell is going on? And we've had a couple of situations where they actually end up ditching the cyber insurance. They're like, nope, we're not going to do cyber insurance. It's too expensive. We're just not going to do it. And they take a step backward and remove your advanced security stack because they're just like, there's nothing we can do about this. We're just, we're just henpecked. And so that, that is one of the situations that really, really we see people not working out on. 
Can, and, I, can I tell you a story real quick that yeah. drive this home? Um, so Will Nobles um, is working with John DePero. John DePero and Will, they're going to be speaking at the road show. And they just so, because I'm seeing questions here about, am, am I working on campaigns regarding this? And the answer is, yes, I am. And at Roadshow, you're going to get that, right? So Jeff, put the Roadshow link so we can plug that. But, and Bruce will be there too. So what happened was I instructed Will Noble's salespeople. I said, go to every client and ask them to send their cyber liability, their crime insurance, and uh, officers and directors, directors and officers, and any other liability or risk mitigating insurance policies and tell them they're gonna, Will had them send, the, the, so the salespeople got them and they said the clients just wrote like, like no problem. Here's, here is the, our policy and here's the guy who sold it to us, email them in. And what, the, what they did is they are having their security operations team review those policies and compare it against what are we delivering versus what those policies said. So there was a client they had who was a good client and what came out of that review of their insurance policy was that they had a $39 million contract with the Navy and they were not CMMC certified secure. Like there were things and their policies from their insurance policies, there were things that they were saying they were doing on that, that Will's team was not doing. And so when they came back to that client to talk about this, the client was, wasn't like, oh, I'm so happy you did. The client was pissed. The client's like, I thought you were doing all this stuff for us. And to, to be fair to Vector Choice, they're like, well, you never, like which, who on this call has had a client send you their insurance policy and say, we need to make sure that we're doing everything on this declarations page that we're saying we're doing. Like, like he, so this client never said, hey, I got a $39 million contract with the Navy. This client never said, you know, hey, we need to make sure that the insurance policies we have in place are, you know, going to be going to hold up if we got audited. And so, you know, the thing is now, like you would think, I mean, now they're going to save this client, but imagine if they hadn't done that. Imagine if an insurance company came in and looked at everything and said, you know, like Rusty, someone like Rusty, who knows what the hell they're doing, you know, you're really not CMMC certified. You're going to lose your $39 million government contract. Like that is like a big, big issue. And that client would have been unbelievably pissed if it came from a third party versus the MSP in this case coming forward and saying, we got to address this. At least now they have the opportunity to save that client. And I think that's, I mean, that's critical. I, Robin, the, the major piece here is so be, be proactive, get to your clients, especially those big clients, the ones that you're worried about. Like a lot of people say, oh my gosh, I can't get to everybody. I, this is a situation where you're going to want to pick your frequent flyers and get to them right away. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I want to warn people about is filling out those self-assessment questionnaires without understanding the context. Mm -hmm. You know, I mentioned all of these different things that are going on right now. And when you go through and fill this out, so for instance, um, we just, we did a similar situation. We actually reached out and we got 13 different cyber insurance assessments from the underwriters directly that they're asking about. We compiled them. There's 110 questions that we identified that are critical. And what we found is that one of them, and this is, I'm not going to name the insurance carrier because I, I don't think that I should do that on stage here. But um, one of them is asking, can you recover? Can, are your backup systems set up in a way that you can recover from an malware or ransomware event in under 24 hours? And if you answer yes to that, um, anybody that's ever done incident response is going to tell you like, that's not possible because if you say yes to that, now all of a sudden when their forensic team rolls in and they are like, you can't touch anything, you can't recover anything, you can't do anything. Now all of a sudden the timer started, but you don't get to move for two to five business days. Like think about what that means. And so understand the context about the risk that they're trying to get rid of is really, really, really important here. And also understanding how to answer that question. So the answer isn't no. If you answer no, now all of a sudden, they're going to be crawling up your rear end asking questions about why you can't restore in 24 hours. The answer is, and you might want to grab a pencil and write this down, because the answer is yes, we do have them set up so we can restore within 24 hours. However, we've done a tabletop exercise, 
and we analyzed risk and determined that in the actual ransomware event or the malware event, we would need time for forensics. So that will make it take longer than 24 hours to recover. Now, when that underwriter looks at that, they're seeing the right words. They're seeing risk analysis, tabletop, like the things that you're actually doing. And by the way, you should be doing those things. Don't just write down and, and, say, and do it without actually executing on those steps. But that's how you can handle this. And the other thing that we're seeing is we're seeing folks giving away services to address the gap. So for instance, there's a, um, there's a insurance provider, there's actually a, shows up on three of the underwriters. And these are nationwide underwriters, by the way, there's only a couple out there. It's not like there's hundreds of these. And this is showing up on three of the different forms. And it's basically, do you do a monthly vulnerability scan? And so what we're seeing people do is say, no, we don't do that right now, but we're going to. So we're going to say yes, and we're going to give it to our client for free. And the thing is, is that people are making money on these simple items. Like that situation where vector form ran into that issue, I know that they didn't just give away services to get them compliant. That's not the answer here. That's the answer to put yourself out of business land. And so make sure that you're billing them and you're actually talking to them up front so that you can turn these into money-making opportunities. I think that's a great time to jump into and talk about what is working. So if we were to jump in and talk about you know, what is going on here, what is actually working, the first piece is talking to your clients before the insurance people do. And that is so, so critical. Um, one of the things that also you know, comes up is you can even turn this process of talking to your clients before your, the insurance people do into an opportunity to, remember we talked about not sharing blocks earlier, right? Like you can turn this into an opportunity to take other folks' clients, which is another way to do this. Basically go in, say, hey, we'd like to do an insurance readiness assessment for you. You don't have an insurance provider with you, but you can still go in and do that. And now all of a sudden you're talking to somebody about something that their MSP probably hasn't even thought of. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing people do that, Robin? I'm just curious because you mentioned um, the gentleman that, that's doing the, uh, the risk assessments from the insurance perspective and, and going through and, and using compliance manager for that. Some, but you know, like anything else, when I try and get them to do marketing, it's like banging my head against the wall. So, um, you know, the pro what, I'm, what I'm suggesting for all of you right now is start with your existing clients, go to every one of your clients and talk about you know, go ask them to introduce you to their insurance guy, gal, and you want to do a policy review of any cyber liability, any crime, any kind of business interruption insurance. Um, directors and officers would be another one. And, um, or just general business liability, right? And say, you know, and, and you, here's the other thing. You are not an insurance expert. You need to sit down with their insurance guy and say, look, Show me on this policy where if they got a, if they got breached, where you would, per, you know, you would for recovery costs and like emergency IT support and lost business or notification or whatever. Show me what what their actual coverages are. And then what do I need to be doing as their IT guy to make sure that this policy this won't be denied? Um, and it's usually on the application, right? So the, so you don't like, don't just like get the policy and then try to decipher it. Cause you won't know you're going to have to sit down with them. And by doing that, you're going to find, you're going to provide value for your clients. But the other reason for doing that is to gain a potential JV partner in the future. So like, okay, so you sit down and you have this conversation your client isn't like, if I sent to my insurance guy, I said, look, you need to talk to Bruce McCauley because, you know, he's my IT guy and you, you know, you sold us his poly and I'm telling you, you need to sit down with him. That insurance guy is going to take that meeting. Number one, number two, that, that insurance person is going to work with them. Number three, then what you do is now that you have this relationship with the mutual client, you say to them, by the way, do you have other clients who you sold this policy to? And they say, well, sure we have. Do you feel like they are like my client, our mutual client, where their IT company might not be doing the things and that would cause their policy to be declined? Well, of course there is. 
well, would you be, would, would it be a ridiculous, do a Chris Voss, would it be a ridiculous idea for us to talk about some sort of a partnership where you could introduce me to some of those people and I could do a similar, just like use your galactic scan and do a, you know, a, just a quick pen test to see if we could even get in. You see what I mean? So that's, that's the process we're using right now, but then we are building some other prospecting campaigns. Hey guys, do me a huge favor, hit us in chat. I'm just curious that, that review, what Robin just described, sitting down with them and reviewing that checklist or reviewing that agreement. If we had a checklist like that, um, I, if I brought one to Roadshow, would that be something you guys want? Like hit, hit me over on chat. Cause that would be like, I could put something okay. together if that's something, yeah, I had a feeling that was something people would be interested in. All right, well, so, yeah, that's, that's so there's, there's your reason. There, if you, if it's, show. exactly, yeah, right, that's, yeah. no, I was gonna say, there's your reason to get up early because I'm doing the breakfast session at Roadshow. <laughs> well, but, but the whole day, like guys, that's what a lot, the whole day, second day of Roadshow is really about that. And you know, what mom doing on the first day is really about getting high value clients and how high HVCs and HVCs are clients that are very risk adverse. I mean, if you remember back at boot camp, um, not this year, but the year prior, um, well, Marcus Limonis got hacked. If you remember him saying it was like devastating to him and he talked about that. And then the year before that, we had Kevin O'Leary and he said, cyber liability is the number one thing that keeps him up at night. And so, you know, Marcus Limonis and Kevin O'Leary are investors in very big firms. So the larger the company is, the more the CEO and is going to be risk adverse because they've got investors, they've got boards, they've got, you know, they just have more at risk. And those are the, those are the higher paying clients. So if you're not doing what Bruce is talking about right now, those customers aren't even going to begin to, if they're going to get aware of this and they're not even going to be talking to you. Guys. And that's, that's one of the things I'm going to be talking about on day two. The first thing in the morning is I'm going to be talking about being a chief security officer for your client. And those are those bigger upstream clients. It's perfect tie-in and why, I mean, Robin's going through how to go and grab those big clients. My session is on how to take those big clients and communicate at the board level. Because once you start talking at the board level, once you start having conversations with the senior vice president of Coca-Cola and they refer you to somebody else that needs your help because they sit on a board at that location, now all of a sudden you've created yourself a stack of dominoes that turns into great opportunities for you to move upstream, which is what Robin's talking about on day one. So yeah, definitely you're going to want to get your rear end to roadshow. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, one thing that I just also want to talk about, you know, we said what's not working, right? W what's not working is, is basically letting them talk to your clients, but let's focus on that journey. Like what is working? When you start focusing on education and you start taking those basic needs clients and and educating them along the way and helping them move to that security minded spot. This starts to work not only for your clients, but for prospects when you show them why they should be doing this stuff. And what I wanna do is I just wanna remind you the whole sales process. This is, this is a sales process that, that Robin's taught me over the years and that uh, we've, we've basically put together and used with our, with our partners, like the folks that are using our stuff. This is what we recommend to them, which is basically you have an incoming form. So some sort of incoming form that somebody on your team, even your help desk person can go in and fill in. They're going to fill out a simple question. Why now? Because it's kind of a critical piece and schedule a 26 minute phone call right there with them right on the call with you. Then you're going to send over a shock and awe credibility email that has testimonials in it a non-disclosure agreement in it. And then you're going to get on that phone and you're going to have that 26 minute phone call. You're going to ask some questions, build anxiety with those questions. These questions are all about risk, right? They're not about things like how their tech is working. They're not about buttons and dials. They're about risk and making them realize that they have a risk that they are undertaking if they don't have all of this stuff in a row. And then right then you start that third party analysis. And our analysis is super simple. Robin mentioned it earlier. You send them a link. They click on a link. There's no passwords required or anything like that. We go through, we analyze their security for you, and then we provide you a report of findings within two business days. So it doesn't even require any tech time on your team at all. And the nice thing about that is, you know, you, you schedule the readout on that phone call and you go to do that readout. Who here, I mean, hit us up in chat. Have you ever had a lead, oh, I don't know, go cold? 
you know, they, they like stop responding to you and you have to like get some way to get back in touch with them. I, the six world word email, nine world word email, like I, I had, I had edited the nine word email a little bit in my, my time, got it down to six. But um, the, uh, the thing is, is that when that happens, if you have an analysis and you call and you leave a voicemail for them and you say, Hey, um, I was, I was just looking at some of these results. I had some concerns. Could we grab a time to talk about those? That just knocks that whole cold objection, all that stuff right off the screen and you're moving forward again. So get the analysis done right away and then simply prepare for the readout. Now, we talked about blocks a little earlier. And a lot of folks, when you guys prepare for readouts, you do things like sort data. Like you take a bunch of data, and you take pages of data, and you put it onto something like a report, and you say to them, hey, this is, this is our findings. I want you to prepare differently because that doesn't work. Like your CEO gets bored when you're sitting there going through reported data. What they really need is they need a story to understand what their risk is. Because ultimately, when you use stories to illustrate business risk, that engages that prospect. That helps them understand. I remember, you know, Robin mentioned that I was uh, her uh, uh, MSP. Like, I, I remember, Robin, I don't know if you remember this, but you made me sit down with Nicole before I was able to sit down with you because you were like, I don't want to sit in that meeting. That's going to be boring. And I, it was going to, I was going to tech barf all over the table for you. Um, <laughs> Because, because we all think about this and we all think we need to educate people on how this stuff works. And really, we got to edu educate them on the business risk. And so how do you create a good story that educates on business risk? Well, there's a couple of things that you can do here. The first thing is, is it's all about preparation. You know, would you ever do a project without having prepared or a project plan? I shouldn't be asking this because I'm sure some of you are probably thinking, yeah, we do that all the time. But Ultimately, I want you to have a plan when you go in. And what we found is, is that when you have a story that has these couple of steps, you have a spot where you talk about who, the current state, what happened, the business outcome, and then you relate that back to a finding. It works much, much better at illustrating what's going on. And I'm not going to go through this story like line by line, but here's an example of a story that's not technical, because I don't want you to think these all have to be technical stories, that illustrates risk and illustrates a finding and how it impacts the business. Then you go through and you share the results of the, the actual findings, right? So you take the report. Now, this is an example of one of our reports, super simple to understand. You go through, you show them the scorecard, and then you say, you know, I think we should probably focus on some of these red things. You jump into the red item. And for instance, you know, we cracked passwords. So you tell them you cracked passwords, but instead of saying, oh my God, we cracked passwords, hackers are gonna break in here and steal everything. Instead of doing that, what you do is you bring up that whole story and you say, you know what, this reminds me of a situation. And you go through all of those different components that we just talked about. So this reminds me of a situation where a partner in an accounting firm um, who actually, they thought they had everything safe. Like they thought they were completely secure and they got into a situation where hackers submitted 180 tax returns on their client's behalf. And the IRS actually suspended their ability to do e-filings. I mean, imagine, imagine being an accounting firm that's not able to submit e-filings. And this is all because somebody is able to get to a password like the one on this report. And so you can go through a couple more details if you want about how that all happened. But the bottom line is when you have a story like this that they understand, and this actually happened, um, we actually did the forensics work for this and it was terrible. They tricked, they actually tricked this partner into clicking a link, they clicked the link, they use that to get into their email. Once they got in their email, they were able to reset the password in the accounting software. And then they just went into the accounting software and did all the things that they, were, they wanted to do. So you can go through and share the results like that. The other thing that we do is we actually alert items that are insurability alerts for you. So if there's something out there that's a problem from an insurability standpoint, that'll show up right on the report for you. So you can be like, oh, and this links back to the insurability findings. And we do give you those findings so that you can take a look at those. We have a whole system for going through and making sure that you have those and you give them the ins cyber insurance readiness assessment so that they understand where they're at from the cyber insurance program. You present your solution 
Now I recommend two different pieces to your stack. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that at the road show if you want to swing by. And then you give them that this is what you're currently doing, my, my normal managed services. And I'm really recommending that you add this advanced security stack. And oh, by the way, here's the findings from that insurance if you go through and have our advanced security stack installed. You review your agreement, super simple. And this is, this is one of the questions that, uh, that I found to be really helpful, which is to get the objections out of the way, right? And I always feel like a used car salesperson when I say this, but besides price, what would stop you from moving forward with us? And then after you have that, what do you do? You show them the price and you give them the magic pen. Now, the magic pen is, is something different. We, like, I came up with this after, like, you give them this, this contract and they have the price and they have everything, like, they're ready to go. How do you get them to actually sign it? Like, how do you go through that waiting process? And so what I would do is I would just give them a pen with my logo on it and stuff at that time. And that pen did this crazy thing for us. It asked them, hey, are you going to sign this or what? And that was actually really effective and it helped our close rates a lot. So that would be a, a quick rundown of what is working. And we have partners doing that out there right now, both with their clients and with prospects. Because if you take your essential IT program and you compare it to the existing prospects managed service provider, chances are they don't have an advanced security stack, which you'll learn about in Roadshow. Because I know that... Uh, I believe Charles is going through and talking about advanced security stacks at the Roadshow as well. So that would be a really good session for you, especially if you don't already have something like that put together. Mm -hmm. and, and he's a he's a client of yours, isn't he? Uh, he is not. We've done an audit for him. Um, we've done a few audits for for their uh, for folks associated with him, but we haven't actually uh, we haven't actually landed him yet. I have to go right. bother him again. Him. That, <laughs> that, that, he, that that can't be. That, that, that shocks me. That's <laughs> You know, one other thing, like last thing I would do, whether they sign up or not, and this is, this is kind of like a kind of twist, whether they sign up or not, I'd ask for a referral. You just did something for them. Like you just helped them. You just educated them. And chances are you showed them a bunch of stuff they didn't know. And you could do this like the dumb way, which is like, uh, did you get value from this? Could you like do me a favor and tell me somebody that you'd like? want me to work with too. You can do it the dumb way. The way I like to do it though, is I like to say this. I like to say, you know, those cyber insurance folks, they're, they're really worried about ransomware. And they're worried about it because risk is going up and they're getting their asses handed to them. So the easiest way for ransomware to get into your network is by somebody phishing you, like a phishing campaign. Think about it. And the easiest way to fish somebody is to email them from somebody they know. Is there anybody that you exchange a lot of emails with that, would, that you'd like us to go through and make sure that they're also safe? Because now what we did is we didn't just ask for a referral. We made it a benefit to the person you're talking to as well. And I think that's really, really effective. We've had a lot of great results with that. So just, I mean, we, do, we actually do this when we uh, assess an MSP, like we'll ask them the same exact questions. Do you have any other MSPs that you send a lot of emails back and forth with? And I mean, we're, we're legit, we're interested in helping protect a million people. I mean, this is part of the program. So we usually get like three or four, sometimes five MSP referrals out of that just conversation and, and our partners are doing the same thing and it's working real well. So do make sure you're asking for the referral when you're done with that assessment. Don't wait till they're a client. You can ask again later, but ask right at the end of the assessment because you just, you just knocked their socks off with a bunch of really important information and educated them, help them out. Yeah. I mean, it's funny you're saying that like I'm pulling up my roadshow presentation and it's like, wait a minute, have you hacked into my, um, cause maybe I've been looking at it. Well, no, because, you know, I think it, why don't people refer? And it's sometimes like, oh, I don't know who needs IT, but if the way that you're, um, you're asking about it is, and the referral marketing templates and whatnot, I mean, that's what we're telling them to do with their, with their clients to go to their insurance guy first and, and, and then flip that into a referral. And, I mean, cause look, that insurance guy, someone's doing his IT or her IT as well. Right. So there you go. Right now you've got a client introducing you, ask your client, you know, who's your CPA? Who's doing your, who's doing your payroll? 
Um, you know, who's your financial advisor who has access to all your investment accounts? What, what bank are you working with? Right. And, you know, when you start saying to them, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a way of getting a referral and the way you approach it is you get that client to say, Hey, this is my IT company. This is my, I need you to have a meeting with them to discuss protecting me. They're going to take that meeting. Right. And then, yeah, make that meeting about here's the things that we found. Here's what we do. Here's what we're doing for this client. I just got to make sure since you're doing their bookkeeping, who's doing your IT? What was the last time? Have you been audited? You know, have you done a quick pen test? Because I'm going to go back to your client and tell them what I discovered. I mean, we'll have to say it more elegantly than that. But, you know, that's exactly what we're this right now. This is a huge opportunity. So you're spot on. Well, and, and you know, Robin, like. I, I capped in a, an accountability group and a lot of people on that, in that group, they're always, you know, like, like talking about how hard it is to get, you know, to actually grow a relationship with a cold lead. And this cuts through that. Like, I mean, you know, I always like, I, I like to say, think like a hacker, think like a hacker. Like what would a hacker do? A hacker would Convert this into a way that the person across the table is like, oh, that that does benefit me. Let me let me think about that and give you somebody right here and now. That's mm -hmm. what I want you to do, guys. 100%. 100%. All right. Do you want to take questions? I don't know where you well, are. Yeah, well, you know, I just had one last thing that I kind of wanted to go through here sure, just really ahead. quick. And We're that is... questions, guys. Keep posting. I'm just like, I just want to let them know that I haven't forgotten you. All right. So... A couple of questions that we've seen. Now, this one has only come up on one underwriter's assessment, but I think it's going to start coming up more, which is how often are third-party penetration tests being performed? The other one that we're seeing, and we saw this on six of 13, so we're scoring this pretty high, which is how often are vulnerabilities assessments being done in the environments? And if you answer 90 days to this, after speaking to an underwriting team, they will approve the insurance, but they're going to increase your rates. Okay, so you want to be answering something like 30 days to this. And one of the things I just wanted to bring up is, you know, if you're sitting there on this call and you're thinking to yourself, we've got our security working, like we're performing these assessments like clockwork, we're doing them every 30 days. I want you to also think about what you're really doing when it comes to that. Because most of the time, what we're finding is MSPs are cobbling tools together and they're wasting their time and they're missing security issues. I mean, if you have somebody on your team that is responsible for analyzing those vulnerabilities, I mean, think about it. You have somebody on your team. I, we're, as an MSP, you're super smart. Like you guys have all of that stuff in place, right? And so it's easy for you to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to put somebody responsible for security and they're going to analyze all those vulnerabilities. And, you know, I've, Robin helped me with the pitch. Like, gosh, it was, oh, I don't know, a year ago. Um, to Mr. Wonderful. And she's like, you know, you can't proofread your own work. And she's absolutely right. When we go and we audit the networks where you have a security person that's going through and, and analyzing their own security, their controls work. Like their controls are in place. Like this little fence, it's there. But there's a whole bunch of green space around those controls and we trips in and out. No problems, no stopping us. Like it's super simple. So if you're proofreading your own work, chances are, there's a bunch of holes outside of the actual controls that you're putting up. And even if you're compliance, that, compliant, that doesn't mean you're secure. Like that CMMC compliance stuff, that doesn't mean that you're actually secure. That means that you followed the controls they've recommended and you've implemented those. But it doesn't mean that I can't just go around one of them. And so if you're giving this stuff out for free, like if you're giving away free vulnerability scans to your clients or something like this, I have something that I want you to think about. Like, I want you to think about a different way of doing it where you say to your client, hey, we're gonna have a third party take care of this for us. And I wanna have a third party because it's gonna keep me accountable. It's gonna make sure that I have the right things in place. It's gonna help me make sure that my team isn't proofreading their own work. And by the way, if you Google, just you know, whip out the Googles and you search how much does a pen test cost, the first hit you're going to see is a pen test costs between 10 and 30,000 bucks and your client will see that too. What if we gave you a way that automated that whole thing? Like what if we gave you a way that we provided white glove done for you service when it comes to reviewing your 
clients' networks like Clockwork as a third party. We provide the reports for you to review as a draft. If you want to fix issues, you can. You still, we, we still make sure that those get reported to the client, but we say these were already taken care of. We just wanted to mention them. And then you share that final report with your client. It's a very, very effective way to take care of some of these insurance requirements. And we don't just do a pen test. Like we're not just doing a penetration test. We're doing the internal external vulnerability assessment. We do an M365 analysis. We even look at groups like your administrative groups and see if a hacker's had it, added somebody to it that they shouldn't have. And the price point for this guys is not 10,000 bucks. Like it starts at 220 bucks and we take care of everything for you. So if this is something that you're interested in, www.galacticscan.com slash recurring. And um, I guess it's time to do some, oh wait, I had one last thing. Till the end of this month, we're starting at 110 bucks because we're still working on some beta pieces of this. And I need, I need at least 200 clients on this, uh, this client watch program and we're almost there. So uh, if you're interested and this is something you want to get do, happening now, as part of my mission to help protect a million people, we're knocking that down to 110 225 and 325. So if this is something you need in place in your MSP, like you're not doing it right now, swing by www.galacticscan.com slash recurring. All right. I think it's question time, Robin. Yeah. I like that. I'm just writing down here because I think one of the things I want to, I'm working on some new campaigns and one being a closer look. And it's kind of like, maybe it's time you take a closer look at what your current IT company is doing for you. Because that was a very successful campaign during COVID we had a little different spin on it. Now it's your employees are working from home, uh, your insurance companies. Um, but then the other thing is just, you know, who, who's, who's, who's monitoring your, your MSP, you know, who's checking their work, you know, and that's another little wedge you can put into your shock and all your unique selling proposition. Your like, it's all the things. So I, I like that, um, you know, who's, who's auditing, um, you know, your, in your MSP. You know, um, anyway, so so very, very cool. All right. So, yeah, let, this is great. Let's let's go to some questions. Um, uh, there's a, anonymous attendee. And this was back when we were talking about insurance companies selling cybersecurity um, services. And it says he, they're saying conflict of interest, question mark, insurance selling the MSP. And no, it's not a conflict of interest because the insurance company is not like auditing it. The insurance company is saying, we're covering your ass if, if you get breached. It makes absolute sense. If I'm going to be on the hook for paying out, then why I, I can't take responsibility for things I can't control, right? So, you, you know, one thing I would add to that is I think about who the insurance company works for. Like, does the insurance company work for you, Mr. MSP or Mrs. MSP? No. Does it work for your client? No. The insurance company is in business of risk transference. Like we take a risk that we can't mitigate with controls. Like, so we have this, you know, this control, like that little gate and we can't figure out how to like make sure that somebody can't climb over it. So we take that risk and we basically pay somebody to take it off of our plate. That's the insurance company. So when we think of, when you think of an insurance company, like working for your client, you're, you're wrong. The insurance company is working for themselves and they are basically selling their ability to take on risk to your client. And that's, that's a big difference that I think people really have a hard time understanding because they're used to dealing with these little retail insurance people. You know, like if you have a client that's maybe doing a $2 million policy, like that's not big enough to really be handled by somebody that's that's like a huge insurance company but once you start working with huge insurance companies that are breaking up and basically towering out risk like these folks are serious and they are not working for you they are not working for their clients or your you, the client they're working for themselves yeah all right so the next question um, i'm going to answer it live here do you have a recommendation for approaching an insurance company regarding a possible partnership um, I'm just, you know, noting again, we talked about that. The way you do it is you go to your existing client and you say, I need to be introduced to the insurance company that sold you your crime, your cyber liability, um, you know, any of the um, liability coverage that you have. And you, you're going to get it. You're going to get invited by a mutual client. 
Like you can't ask for a better way. So that's the way I would approach that. Okay. Um, Bill Swank said, uh, Bruce, uh, he, you um, showed and discussed the notice from an insurance company, that exchange issue. Curious to, as the rough day the notice was received, was it recent or was it timely, which would have been about February, March of 21? Uh, that notice came out about five months ago, four months ago. So it, it's not brand new. Um, but it is within the last six months. And I understand that vulnerability is a, like a year old. Guys, the server, when we really looked into it, the server that they found was an SPF record. I'm, I'm about to nerd out on you, Robin. I'm sorry. But it was, a, it was an SPF record for a exchange server that was sending mail for them that they had hosted their stuff a really long time ago and the MSP never removed that SPF record. So that's kind of the backstory and shame on them for not like updating that server. But yeah, that patch had been around for a year at that time. Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, and so again, Anonymous is saying, um, do we need to become insurance salespeople? Um, well, I mean, I guess you could take on that profession. Um, you got to get a license for it. Like, unlike being an MSP, anybody can say they're an MSP. Like you actually need to, uh, have certain credentials to sell insurance. But, uh, I think that that was more of just a, you know, drive by. Um, actually, uh, Robin, I would just add though, there's, there's one piece here that I think is really important, which is you definitely need to be able to overcome the objection of well, I bought cyber insurance, so I don't need your advanced security stack. And the other objection of, I have your advanced security stack, so I really don't need cyber insurance. Like, be prepared for those two questions to come up and be able to respond to them so that you're not like putting yourself in a spot where they're getting cyber insurance and ditching you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Very good. All right. So um, next question was from uh, Brian Butterfield. Hey, Brian. Um, is there a plan for us to create campaigns around cyber insurance? Yes, there is. Um, but it's not necessarily just about insurance. It's like I said, I'm working on the closer look campaign. Bruce, you and I are talking tomorrow. We're going to be working on some campaign specific for galactic advisors. And it is going to be all around. It's, it's time. Like you need to reevaluate your current MSP because of the insurance. There's more regulations that are happening PCI compliance is going to get, uh, they're starting to be tightening down on that. Um, there's, so there's changes. So we are working on that um, and, and they will come out at Roadshow, some of it, and some of it over towards the end of this year. And that's why we call Roadshow this year, the great MSP reset is because I think it's the, with this insurance, what, what insurance companies are now pushing, you're, you're, you're being forced guys, you will lose these clients. Um, if you don't get these better protections and take this to the, the next level. So, um, all right, Kim uh, says, uh, let me answer this live. Uh, we did piggyback, uh, piggyback off Will and ask our clients for cyber policies. Everyone sent their policies, but there is something we didn't do. We didn't ask for the crime. How do we go back and ask for that? Um, what do you, what do, um, would you suggest we take care of the cyber and then ask if they have any other policies? Yeah, I think just go back to them and say, hey, by the way, you know, well, first of all, if you sit down with that insurance agent, there's a good chance that cyber crime and cyber liability are kind of kindred spirits. Crime covers if I get my bank, like if someone hacks into my, uh, my business and somehow gets into my bank account and, and drains my bank account, that's covered under crime, um, as is like if an employee is stealing or something like that, right? Cyber liability is I get hacked and now I've got to notify, I got to notify clients, I might get sued, I might get whatever. That covers attorney's fees and emergency IT costs. And, you know, again, every policy is written a little different. So I just go back to your clients and say, is this the only, what other policies do you have? So crime, cyber liability, um, let me pull this up real quick too. So you, you also want to look at, um, let me give me, give me a second here, um, just a, as a review, um, directors and uh, uh, property and casualty, you know, as well, and directors and officers, um, any kind of employment practice insurance you would have, um, cyber and fiduciary liability. Um, so the, those are the main things. So property and casualty, 
and and so again, you know, I keep pushing roadshow, and everyone's going to get mad at me for it. So anyway, but like that's why I'm bringing Rusty in. He can he's going to be talking about that specifically at roadshow because he is an insurance guy and he knows what to what to ask. So just go back and say, you know, do you have any of these other um, policies that I just listed? All right, um, all right. So then Scott is saying. Does your pen test meet the requirements of the FTC safeguard rules going live in December? Yep, we are there. So uh, if you want to- What wanna, are they? Can you explain that a little bit? What you know, I, I'm not going to, no, I'm not going to go into, uh, into all that because there's actually some little issues about uh, what's really going to happen. So I'm going to hold off on saying uh, the details on that. However, I was just about to say, we have uh, two different folks on our team that are chasing that all down and making sure that everything is covered and they will be and is taken care of. Okay, so I'm just I'm googling it. It uh, requires covered financial institutions develop, implement, and maintain an information security program. Okay, well, good news for you guys. All right, um, Ronald saying, "Will this work in Mac environments?" No. No, we are not Mac environment friendly. Uh, however, we will be in about 60 days. Okay, so there you go. Can, can, can Macs be hacked? That's the problem. They just can't be hacked. So no, I'm just kidding. Oh my gosh, can you imagine if I right, said that? Everyone's like, I don't need that because I have a uh, Mac. I can't get hacked. You know? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's actually crazy. Like the, I've just actually saw a beta of our, um, our testing tools for Mac last Thursday and it's just, it's nuts the stuff that you can get to. Um, so those are those are coming your way very soon. And the crazy thing about Max, like on the PC side, and we have a we have a pretty large group of people that are part of our beta community, and they give us all this feedback that we use to make sure that you know we don't trigger antivirus and we don't trigger EDR and all this stuff. And on the Mac side, like people don't put antivirus on it, so it's so much easier. Like it, it actually it it actually makes it easier when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. There you have it. All right. Paul is saying, is, is this a different program than the portal.galactic scan, the pen test program he offers? I already have it. So I'm trying to determine if this is a different offering. Yeah. So what you have is you have Galactic Watch, I'm pretty sure, just based on what you're saying, which mm -hmm. is we go through and we analyze your environment. That's where we start. Because if think about it, if the MSP's network isn't safe, but we're auditing the client network, and the MSP is what's spreading the ransomware. Like it doesn't matter whether they're secure or not because they have the keys, the hackers have the keys to the kingdom anyway. So we start with the MSP with Galactic Watch and then Client Watch is for those clients that you have that you wanna make sure that you're doing these vulnerability assessments on an ongoing basis and stuff like this. And that's where when we, it's, all, it's all white glove done for you as in, we take care of doing the assessment for you. We take care of reading out and generating all of the findings for you. Like there's no tech people really that need to be involved with this, except, you know, you may want to have your tech person look at the results to make sure that there's nothing they want to remediate like pronto. Um, but that's, uh, that's it. Like they're not having to put together the reports because then again, you have a tech like basically evaluating their own network and their own, their own work. Okay, there you go. Well, reach out to Paul, reach out to his team. They'll, they'll, they'll help you there. Um, okay, so Tom is saying, do you have to install something on the client site in order to do the scan? Or could we, could we scan a prospect? I know the answer to that, but I'm going to let you do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, there's two things that we can do. The first one is you can have them click a link and we'll analyze their environment. No install, nothing happens from that standpoint. And we're gonna do it from the inside of their environment and we're gonna show you what we get to. And it's shocking, actually. I mean, it creates an experience. It creates that aha moment because when you think about it and we're talking about education, people learn the best when you have an experience. I mean, stories help, but really that experience is what really teaches a user, teaches an executive. So they have the experience of clicking the link. There's no like alerts or any of that other stuff that pops up and all of a sudden they're like, holy cow, this means that if I click a link, this is what's going to happen. So they really start understanding why cyber security is so, so important. The other part, though, is let's say that you have a prospect. Now, you can't do this without their permission. We have a whole bunch of stuff to educate you on how to do it. 
But let's say you have a prospect that doesn't want to click the link. They just don't want to do it. Well, we can do a linkless analysis where we actually brute force their DNS. We get every single server that's in their environment. We look at every single aspect of the outside of their network. And then we do a vulnerability analysis on that. We do not break in. We can't do a penetration test from the outside without permission and a bunch of legal paperwork. So we can't do that because what if, what if they're hosted somewhere or something like that? But we can do a vulnerability assessment and we will give you an external vulnerability assessment that you can take to that meeting. And it also identifies insurability alerts for those findings as well. Well, I'm glad you answered. I would just said yes. <laughs> 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 Yeah. So, so the, the, the proper answer is just yes. <laughs> so, um, okay. So Sunil, I'm going to add, I'm going to answer this. Um, he's asking, do you have a generic sample cyber insurance application I can use as a cheat sheet? Um, I'll actually post this to you, but I'll also post in the chat. There's actually a, um, it's a, it's a blog for an insurance company. Um, and it's, they've got, it's like a, it, well, it's actually, I take that back. It's a, it's a tech group, but I think they also sell insurance, but there's 20 cyber insurance questions that can help you lower your premium. And so this is a really good example. I'm going to put this in the chat here for everyone. You know, every, every insurance is, is going to have their own questionnaire, you know, but if you just Google, um, you know, I, anyway, I put the chat. You know, there. I would even throw in take a look at Tokyo Marine, um, and that would be a good one to take a gander at. Just Google Tokyo Marine self assessment questionnaire, and that would be a good one. I mean, it's it's pretty thorough. It's one of the more more thorough ones out there. I'm just trying to think the the ones that I would you know okay. throw your way. Yeah. And that was Tokyo Marine, and I feel like I, the city. Yeah, and okay. I spell like a dog, so like I'm not going to try to spell it. <laughs> Actually, I think Robin's dog spells better than me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. All right. Um, he does. He does bite like a bastard, though. Look, look at this. I got this nasty bruise here on my arm, because and that's just from playing. He's just a big bastard, you know. All right. So let me. Uh, Michael Rubin. Hey, Michael. Um, for a client watch, what are your typical MSPs charging for the service? I've underquoted one of my clients for the service and want to get it right going forward. Yeah, so here's there's a couple of different scenarios that you can do here. The first one is those smaller clients, like you're thinking, you know, a small dental office or something like this. Those folks, you're probably going to want to be quoting around 500 bucks a month. So that's the one to 20 kind of area. Once you get up past that 46 mark, you may want to go in and actually provide for them CISO services, which is a little bit more, it's actually a lot more significant. And you'll need a third party assessment as part of that solution because when you build up an entire security program, you kind of need those third party assessments as part of it in order to reach some of these compliance requirements. But you're, you, you'll sell those starting at about five grand a month and up. Like we have, we, I have one partner who's closed five of those so far. And by the way, once you close one of those, like those CISO engagements and you're providing chief security officer solution to your client all of a sudden they're like dominoes like they refer you to other places so he's close five so far we just launched the program in may mm -hmm. and that kind of gives you some idea and i think the last one he closed was like 11 grand a month um mm -hmm. so as you get more confident you basically can kind of just kind of raise those prices a bit mm -hmm. okay there you go um joel guthrie i don't have any clients yet uh, but I plan on getting some of my rapid deployment next week. It's coming to rapid, I guess. Um, yes, we'll so, see you there. Okay, cool. Right. Can we sign up for the service, get familiar with everything so we're ready to go when a client wants to sign up and um, clients with my cybersecurity stack? So talk to me at rapid. Service. We'll yeah. chat. We'll chat with you at rapid. Okay. So, Joel, like, yeah, there you go. Um, and uh, Ron is saying, is the pen test agent based? So if we do client watch, we do install an agent, but that's if we're only doing client watch. If you're doing like a pen test for a prospect, no agents. Nope, that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. And we do some crazy stuff. If you haven't had us do a penetration test for you, for your environment, you know, feel free to, uh, to uh, go to www.galacticscan.com slash stack, S-T-A-C-K, and we'll do a cyber stack analysis for you. Now, just a warning, when we do that, we'll do it for free. It's part of my mission to help protect a million people. 
but we will do the readout with eight to 10 other MSPs in the room. We do obfuscate your data. So it's not like, it's not like they're going to know who's who unless <laughs> like I've had this happen. Somebody's like, they're like, uh, oh my God, that's my password. Like if, if you do that, like they'll know that it's you, right? So don't do that. But it's really helpful because it helps you understand what's working out there and what's not working out there. And it also helps you understand like where you're at from the standpoint of other MSPs. So if you want to do that, www.galacticscan.com slash stack, S-T-A-C-K. And I could spell that one. Okay, well, that's good. You want to, why don't you type it in the chat there too? And I think I got Tokyo Marine. Is Tokyo T, uh, it, let me share. Is it that uh, Tokyo Marine America? I guess that is that, is that where you said to go to get, uh, it's yep. T O K I O. Is that the right one? That sounds right. Okay. It's a multinational insurance holding company. Well, there you go. But you just, I mean, there I are, doubt there's many extra of those. So that sounds like the right one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Because I spelled it a different, anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, now, I think that's, I think there, uh, yeah. So Eric, um, Eric just posted that as well in, um, awesome. in, in the industry release. So thank you for finding that. That's, uh, that's in the chat right now. So you can go check that out. Um, okay. So let me see here. Um, I think guys, if there's any other questions, um, you know, I see like one just in the chat, I can't follow the chat really easy, but why would the insurance broker be interested in us making their clients more secure? It's not their money, it, it is the upstream insurance underwriter. Um, well, so, so you're right, Garrett. I mean, like maybe you go to an insurance guy and he doesn't give a rat's ass about the client that he has. And he's like, I don't really care that, you know, I sold them this policy and if they get denied, F them, right? I would be taking that back to my client and go, you know, this is probably, you need to find yourself somebody else because if I'm an insurance agent and I sell you a policy, if you ever need to come to me and say, you sold me this policy and it's getting denied and you didn't tell me X, Y, and Z, you know, the, a good insurance agent wants their clients to be completely and fully protected because an insurance claim should be a last straw. And, it, and it's also, it's also, you know, it's also not when you get, when, when, a, when an attack happens, when a hack happens, it's not just the cost. There's all kinds of emotional stress and stress and, and problems. I mean, nobody wants like, no one's going to be like, ah, that's okay. I'll get hacked. I got an insurance policy to cover it. It's a disaster. I mean, I've talked to people who've had this hack. And, um, you know, it's, you, you know, all the things If you go read my stupid, irresponsible letter, which I is still today, one of the best damn things I've ever written it I nails used to, use it it. To, to the T of what is going to happen. So if, if you go to that insurance guy or gal and they're like, don't give a rat's ass, I sold them the policy. You should go back to your client and say, you know what, this is, this guy's not so, so great. We ought to, cause he doesn't give a, a, a he doesn't care. Um, I'll just I'll just add to that real quick, just just one comment as well. I mean, there's definitely Robin's right on about the social pressure and why they're going to want to do it. But there's one other thing, which is filling out that self-assessment questionnaire when they're working with somebody that's a dumb dumb that doesn't know what's going on is a real pain in the rear end. And they want to have an easy way to do that. And if they were working with you and you're doing it all the time and you've shown them that you're putting the different controls in place to make this easy for them you're making it easier for them to sell. And so ultimately that's the two different pieces. It's the, they don't wanna be an a-hole in the community. And also it, this just makes it easier for them if, if they have somebody that they're working with. Yeah, I mean, and you know, the other thing I wrote down, you know, I was thinking about this, um, you know, when you were saying, you know, what are the questions uh, in the questionnaire that, that you would ask somebody? You know, one of the questions you should ask is what are the most critical functions in your business that can't be halted? You know, because I don't know if, you know, there's business functions. Like if I'm a payroll company, I better be able to do payroll. I can't be down for a day. I can't be down for three days. I mean, there's real legal risk to that. And um, and so, you know, it's not just, you know, the, the questions you were asking, but there's also this, the functions of a business and insurance is not going to prevent that from happening. All insurance does is help with some of the costs. It doesn't help with reputational damages and lost clients and the stress and anxiety over it. Employees could be leaving. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy stuff that can happen. So, um, yeah, I mean, the insurance, the insurance community, I would say as a whole, 
wants to make sure that their clients are actually not going to have a claim denied when they need it the most, if they're any good. Of course, there's going to be some people out there who are jerks and don't care about other people and don't care what they sold and all the rest of it. But that's not the majority of people. So anyway, but this is great. Any last uh, things you want to say before we wrap up here, Bruce? No, just come and join us at the Roadshow. And let's make sure we get that link out there for folks because uh, I think this is really, really important time to be investing in the communication with your clients and making sure that you're revamping your communication with prospects so that you're ready for this MSP reset that Robin's talking about. Okay, and I'm gonna put you on the spot, all right? Because he is a sponsor and because he's a sponsor, he does get a certain set of free tickets. So um, the other thing is, yeah, but I, he, you gotta go to Bruce to get them. So um, I would say, you know, if, if you're thinking about like, you know, if you're a client or you're even a prospect and you're like, you know, I want to see you in action. I want to talk to you. I want to see more Then you can get, a free, you know, give them a free ticket, Bruce, you know, and that, that way they can come check you out. Yeah, absolutely. I'll do that. Um, if, if, so, if somebody could just throw my email in the chat, um, I'll just shoot me an email and I'll get you a free ticket for sure. Um, I don't know if I have a code, so just okay, shoot me an email. No, yeah. no, we have, we have a, is there a special link? Well, I do. I have a, I actually have a URL for you. You didn't even know this, right? So we already, because we set this up for all sponsors. Um, you know, let me, but let me do this. I'll let you decide who you want to give it out to. I don't want to give that. Perfect. Secret, yeah. You know, but I'll nope, let you decide great. who you think is most appropriate and, and they're free tickets and you get, you know, you're going to get all the content that we're talking about. Um, you're going to get to see Bruce live. He's going to be there both days and he can answer questions. Are you, you could even do demos for him. You could do whatever, right? I mean, when you're, when you're there, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you got the only catch, there's only one catch, which is you got to get your ass out of bed because I'm on stage when they're serving the coffee and the breakfast. So Thank get you. up. Well, the good thing is, here's the good thing is we're doing six. So most of the people who come are local. So like when we're, you know, it's not like boot camp. If we have a breakfast at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m., it's like 3 a.m. for the people who came from Hawaii and California and stuff like that. So they're all local. And so, you know, you guys, it, it's worth it. You're going to be eating your breakfast anyway. So it'll, it'll be definitely worth it. Um, okay. Uh, this has been great, guys. We have it recorded. We'll get you the slides. Um, Bruce will um, deal with you on the roadshow issue. And I would, again, highly recommend that you sign up. Um, Bruce has been working with our members for a long time and they love them. They love Galactic Scan. I mean, we saw it in the chat. People are saying, you know, they absolutely love this service. Um, and uh, so, yeah, 100% recommend it. Okay. Thanks, Robin. This was awesome. Great job, Bruce. Thank you. Appreciate everybody. Okay.